Ladies and gentlemen, Turkledon's Pauldrons here to tell you about some of the games I've been playing lately. My last video, Top 10 Ways to Eat a Ham Sandwich, didn't really pop off the way I hoped, so I'm back to digging this old well again. Like usual, I put the games in the order I think you'll be most interested in to the least. But of course, I know you guys like I know 11 ways to eat a ham sandwich, which is to say I only know 10. So time codes are in the description below if you want to jump around a bit. With that, let's get started. But not before word and special thanks from today's sponsor. Noob the Factionless. If modern gaming has left a turn-based shaped hole in your heart, Noob the Factionless is here to fill it in. Noob the Factionless is the newest turn-based RPG inspired by JRPGs old and new alike. Based on the French web series, comic book, and multimedia franchise Noob, from creators Fabien Fournier and Anne-Laure Jarnet, Noob the Factionless brings a new dimension and level of interactivity to a beloved and celebrated series. Noob the Factionless features rich and colorful locations and characters, challenging and addictive gameplay, and contains contains over 50 hours of content across 300 maps. The story is centered on a comical misfit group of four up-and-coming heroes new to an MMO guild trying desperately to join the ranks of the elite. Interactivity and exploration is key here, as the world is filled with over 750 different avatars for you to interact with. Noob's visual style calls upon classics such as Fantasy Life, Stella Glow, Bravely Default, World of Final Fantasy, The Secret of Mana Remake, and more recently, Trinity Trigger. This is a style I've personally always loved, and I'm glad to see represented here today. In every way, Noob the Factionless is a celebration of and tribute to the RPG genre by fans and for fans. Digital versions are available now on Steam, Nintendo Switch, PS4 and 5, as well as Xbox One and Series S and X. Physical copies for home console are releasing on August 29th and can be pre-ordered now using the links in the description. So swing on by, give it a check, and find out for yourself exactly why this series is so beloved. And of course, thanks once again, Noob the Factionless, for today's sponsorship. Omori. Stop me if this sounds familiar, but Omori is a quirky turn-based RPG indie game with a cute, sometimes avant-garde art style reminiscent of Earthbound that's secretly about depression and some other shit. Now I know that kind of game and that kind of description is about a dime a dozen, but Omori is no worse for wear because of it. While I will concede upfront that Omori didn't hit me emotionally as hard as it may have others, it still hit and was a fantastic journey through night and dark with a lovable cast of characters across two time periods, switching between past and present as well as reality and make-believe. The game is loaded with charming set pieces and enemies, and the battle system uses an interesting approach to Fire Emblem's weapon triangle, a sort of rock-paper-scissors system repainted as character emotions. Certain moves change your party's emotional state across various levels, this affecting their base level stats and efficacy against their adversaries, these emotional states all conveniently color-coded for ease of interpretation. The OST and character portraits carry the emotional weight of the story well and while it can feel slow or a little long at times, the big reveals in the final arcs and the ongoing creeping dread of something sinister and wait make the whole journey worth experiencing. This is definitely one of those games I see other people holding up for years to come as a top 10 JRPG, sort of like an Undertale type of phenomenon, maybe just on a smaller scale. And while it doesn't quite reach those kinds of accolades for me, it's definitely worth the playthrough. Live Alive. Over the summer, we've seen the release of a remake I've always called Live Alive, but is apparently called Live Alive. So I guess I'll call it that now. Remade from its old sprite graphics to new sprite graphics in the HD 2D engine we've first seen used for Octopath Traveler, Live Alive takes on a vibrant new life. The game is structured as a series of short stories you can play in almost any order, each with their own unique gameplay gimmicks, setting, and narrative ideas. Because of this, it can be really hard to talk about the game in a holistic manner. So I'll suffice to say, variety is the spice of life, but given how much you're open to mixing things up, 
mileage may vary. For me, this game was right up my alley. The constant changes stopped it from ever getting boring, and if there was a gimmick I didn't like, it wouldn't be long before I started the next story. Combat in most arcs is turn-based with some light sort of TRPG elements. Battles take place in arenas where characters can move and use attacks with different attack shapes and radiuses. The idea, of course, is to target enemy weaknesses and position yourself appropriately to maximize your amount of targets. Some arcs, however, may not have a real combat system that you need to engage with, such as my personal favorite arc, the Distant Future one, where you play as a little droid navigating a spaceship while a monster prowls the vents and hallways. It very much felt like a mix of Alien and 2001 A Space Odyssey, loaded front to back with tongue-in-cheek references to those and other sci-fi films. The endgame also provides a satisfying way to tie the arcs together, which adds new substance to the style and message of the game, which is significantly more than I can say for Octopath Traveler's attempt at replicating this very ending. Live Alive is probably one of my favorite releases of 2022 and another easy, easy recommendation. And the OST is pure fire. Returnal. Returnal was a game I'd been looking forward to since announcement, despite not being the biggest on roguelikes. I had played through Hades sometime the year before, and while I enjoyed the gameplay, the repetitive nature of the genre, even with the permutations and procedural generation, got a little bit tedious to me, even more so when the game said beat the final boss 10 times to get the true ending. I'm happy to report then that Returnal solves a lot of the repetitiveness I felt in Hades, but it also introduced some issues of its own. The game in short is about an astronaut who crash lands on a hostile planet where she's forced to live and die over and over again until she can solve the mystery of her new environment environment, all the while being haunted by flashes of disconnected memories. Gameplay-wise, it's third-person procedural-generated shooter where all stat advancements are found in RNG item drops or unlocked through frequent use of specific weapons. Only none of these stats are permanent. Every time you die, you start over at base level stats with a starter pistol, retaining only a form of currency and whatever exploration tools you've managed to unlock thus far. Tools such as the sword for melee attacks or the grapple hook. It's this total stat reset every time you die where the formula falls behind that of Hades, making it feel like most times you die, you've gained nothing along the way and your run was ultimately a waste of time. Where Hades, at least had a leveling system you play into in every moment of gameplay. Where it improves, however, is in its shortcut system, which, once unlocked, allows you to bypass bosses and large chunks of dungeons with regularity. The game is brutally difficult in areas, but very inconsistent in that regard. Some of the later game's bosses pose far less of a threat than the early and mid-game bosses, and nothing poses as much of a challenge as the second last biome, which has no real bosses of its own. Just really, really difficult enemy encounters. This isn't going to be a game for everybody, and it can be deeply frustrating, especially when RNG doesn't do you any favors. But it's a deeply rewarding experience for those who can battle through its myriad challenges and come out on top. Even if the conclusion to the story is somewhat lackluster, and felt like it was trying just a little too hard to have some semblance of substance. A substance that, to me, never really felt like it was there. The Evil Within 2. Despite somewhat lackluster reviews for The Evil Within 1 back in the day, I enjoyed the game quite a bit and was looking forward to more of the same with Evil Within 2. What I got from Evil Within 2 was not quite that. In saying that, I'd like to say the game was still quite good, but I prefer the more linear focus of the first game. Evil Within 2 drops the linearity in favor of a more open zone style of gameplay, complete with various side quests, crafting tables, Last of Us drawer searching and material gathering, and an even bigger focus on action over for horror, which isn't altogether a bad thing, but I'm definitely here for the spooks and the macabre, which outside of the first quarter of the game, I felt Evil Within 1 done much better, even if that game also fizzled out in the end. What done me in more than anything in this game though was just Sebastian as a main character. Sebastian is a hardened detective who's been through some shit and that apparently needs to show in the most crass way possible in every line of dialogue, which more often than not comes across as cringy or trying too hard to be cool, which is also kind of cringy itself. You made it here okay. Not sure if okay is the right word, but yeah, I made it. Deadly gas leaks, huh? <laughs> Thanks for saving the worst for last, O'Neill. Hope your loyalty pays off for you in the end. 
Because right now, it seems like they don't give a shit about you. Maybe he was like this in the original Evil Within and I just forgot, or it just didn't hit me as hard. But the writing here in Evil Within 2 just felt noticeably bad, like bottom of the barrel type of stuff. The enemy designs, combat, and some specific encounters and events, however, were really cool. And it was easily worth a playthrough just to see what you'd be dealing with next, even if the story around it all made it really hard to take it seriously. Though I'll personally never get enough of Claire de Lune lulling me into the security of the game's safe zones. It's one of my absolute favorite classical pieces, and the evil within uses it to a very strong effect. Lily wasn't killed in the fire. You know this now. Tell that to my brain. Tell that to the nightmares I've been having for years. Hellblade, Senua's Sacrifice. This is a journey deep into darkness. There will be no more stories after this one. Hellblade is a game that grabbed my attention due to its reputation from an artistic perspective. I'm always interested in checking out more artistically driven experiences like this, and it's rare that experiences like this, especially from indie studios, get a budget like Hellblade did. But its artistic sensibilities also make it hard to properly credit the experience. In essence, Hellblade is a virtualized experience of psychosis, experienced by the player character as she travels through hell and high water on a quest to fulfill a sort of funeral passage. There's a heavy amount of culture behind the quest, characters, and land that would make it hard to explain with more clarity, but that's the general idea of what's going on here. Throughout her journey, Senua is frequently assaulted by denizens of the dark, as well as visions from her own psyche, and I find it hard to say it's a great time experiencing either, but that also might be the point. Combat is lackluster and very exploitable, but not the focus of the game. Puzzles similarly are repetitive and not all too engaging, but also not the focus or purpose of the game. These systems feel like they're just there to fill space in telling the story, and the story itself is relatively good, albeit abrasive by design. The simulated psychosis can be a pain to wade through with filters stacked upon filters and voices playing over voices in the background. Though major props to the sound design team, they done a great job. The writing and research team also deserve major props. But this is where things get complicated. As a game, Senua's Sacrifice isn't a great experience, but as an artistic expression, it can be really powerful. Some of the biggest flaws can be argued to be positives for the artistic intent, and as abrasive as they may be to play through, that kind of just reinforces the point. It's not a game one can properly enjoy in a traditional sense, but for those looking to build an understanding of certain mental illnesses and psychological struggles, it is one of the most illuminating pieces of interactive art on the market. And that alone makes it really hard to overcredit what Senua's sacrifice really is. But whether you like it, love it, hate it, or just feel a little bit in between, that's absolutely going to come down to how you interface with what the game is trying to throw at you. Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice certainly is not for everybody, and at least in half a sense, it really wasn't for me. But in the other half, it absolutely was. So if it isn't very clear yet, I'm very split on this game. I can't say I'm exactly looking forward to playing the sequel, even if I do deeply appreciate what I experienced and learned through this game. I just don't know if I wanna sit through another game that's not exactly that engaging again just to get that artistic perspective. But I will be paying attention to the reviews when the sequel drops, and we'll see how they improved, and I'll play the rest by ear. But evil can come from the hand behind the gods. A familiar hand cold and cruel. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is going to bring us to an end for today's episode. Those are just some of the games I've been playing lately. Let me know in the comments what you guys thought of some of these games and what you've been playing lately. On the next episode, we're going to look at Final Fantasy IV, The Last Guardian, and then take a turn for the spooky with some Ghostwire Tokyo, Madison, and we'll see what else. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, remember, like, comment, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and uh, show up for the next episode. I hope to see you guys there. As always, folks. Thanks for watching.